Hello and welcome to Pods Above Replacement, part of the Padres Hot Tub Podcast Network. My name is Rafi Cantor. I am the producer of Padres Hot Tub and joining me from the Mile High City, our honeymoon period is over. It's John Prakota. Blame it on the honeymoon period all you want. I say just take out the fucking trash, your feet. <laughs> yeah, John and I were in a fight over dishes last night in the sink. Uh, no, uh, you can't this just put them a... in the sink and say they're soaking. That's not. You have to do the dishes, maybe. <laughs> Those eggs got to get loose. Uh, we are, uh, of course, uh, referring to some deep pods above replacement lore, uh, which is that I just got back from my honeymoon, which is also why you haven't uh, seen either of us in a couple of weeks. You applauded me. La- I didn't do anything. I got. I sat on a plane. <laughs> You did it. I guess, yes, we did it. We did it. We came <laughs> back in one piece. And now we are back to talk about the San Diego Padres. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the trade deadline and specifically a little retrospective on the trade deadline in the AJ Preller era. Um, any sort of midseason trades uh, that AJ Preller has made in his tenure in gen- uh, as general manager, we're going to discuss today. And we're going to be talking about kind of, you know, what the the thought process was at the time of those trades and how those trades have aged since. But first, you better be watching us on YouTube. I'm sick of telling you people at this point, (laughs) watch us on there because we have so many graphics that are coming, especially today when we're going to be talking about prospects and we're going to have lots of data and visual aids. Uh, I'm a visual learner. Are you a visual learner, John? Very, very much so. Okay, well, this is the visual learner episode on top of uh, the <laughs> on top of it being the tra- trade deadline episode. Uh, so please watch us on YouTube there. Subscribe. Over 630 of you have already done so, which is really cool. Uh, it'd be great if uh, we could find some more people who were interested in the show. Uh, it's been great finding a little niche audience for this. And uh, certainly that comes when like-minded people subscribe. So please look at that. And of course uh you know follow us on patreon become a patron patreon.com slash padres hot tub community is going strong over there this is a very interesting time to be on the discord uh historically uh since i've been on the discord before i was uh on the ship i was a a passenger on the ship before i was uh, in the bridge so to speak and i remember uh i hit the at everyone button for the first time when the Adam Fraser trade happened and it was like Ooh. it was like are you sure you want to send this to 300 plus people <laughs> and i was like honestly i don't know this trade is a little you- sketch like <laughs> <laughs> but i did it anyway and here we are uh so that's kind of where things stand and uh we are going to now dive into talking about AJ Preller's midseason trades so before we break those down I thought it would be useful for us to set a framework about prospect evaluation and how teams evaluate prospects, uh, especially when it comes to trades. Because when you're trading a major league player for a prospect, there's a lot of guessing that comes in there. Um, And there's a few axioms that are really well laid out in a Fangraphs article from 2018 by Craig Edwards, which I will link down in the show notes or if you're on YouTube in the comments, um, uh, which is called an update to prospect valuation. And it kind of lays out the uh, the theory that Fangraphs uses. Of course, this is an F4 podcast, so we will be subscribing to their school of thought. And uh, yeah, it basically just kind of lays out like how teams value prospects and how you know one can value a prospect and the kind of, present war quote unquote that a prospect has because a prospect is currently not generating you any war that's what makes them a prospect uh and you know basically tries to even the playing fields to figure out a way that you can evaluate what the what a prospect is worth in present war quote unquote um so uh there are a few axioms you know a few kind of basic rules to follow uh when it comes to evaluating prospects with major league talent uh, the first, and this is, I think, the most important to understanding stuff, is that 
present war is more valuable than future war. So if uh, you are trading for a major league player and they can put up two war in 2023, that's more valuable than a player who can put up two war in 2025. Um, and there's a couple of ideas behind that. Um, you need the war now. Typically, if you're buying, especially, like you need, you need that production. Um, the second is, of course, the, there's uncertainty, uncertainty built, built into uh, future war. You know, you think this player is going to give you two war in 2025, but you don't necessarily know for sure. So you kind of have to hedge against that. Um, now, on the flip side, uh, prospects give you something that major league players, especially uh, major league players who are either free agents, uh, you know, playing uh, at contracts that are free agents or in their RB years and therefore are a little bit more expensive. Um, prospects, when they get to the major leagues, they are pre-arbitration players. And so that means they are very, 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 very cheap, very underpaid. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that's agreed upon with the labor unions. It's part of the business. You know, it is what it is. Um, but prospects derive their value from the fact that they can give you surplus value. You know, you are paying prospects something on the order of $750,000 for the first three years that they are in the big leagues, but their production, their on-field production counts the same as the on-field production of your Manny Machados and your Xander Bogarts, et cetera, et cetera. So the difference in what, you know, a three war uh, player who is a rookie and is generating all that for basically no money at all versus a three-war player who's getting paid like a three-war player, that is to say somewhere between 25 and $30 million a year, that is uh, basically what the, what the surplus war is. That's what prospects derive their value from, is kind of you're hoping on this idea that they can come up and give you all of this cheap production. Um, and uh, basically, this presents this kind of weird thing of like, okay, we have these guys that can give us value now. And of course, the value now is more valuable than the value in the future. And there are also these prospects who cannot give us any value now. But if they do give us value in the future, it'll be super cheap. So how do we reconcile those two things, essentially? And that's the question that this article tries to answer in Fangraphs. And basically, they have assigned what they label as present day war and present day value to certain prospect grades. And what this present day war and present day value essentially tries to bake in is uncertainty and future, the discount that you have to take on future war because it's happening in the future and not now. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, you will see on screen what we're referring to. Um, they basically are able to assign present day war and present day value to Every type of prospect from a 70 grade prospect, this is the creme de la creme. This is your Vlad Guerrero Juniors. I don't even think Fernando Tatis was graded 70. I think he topped out at 65. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but it's it, it's somewhere in that order. Of, You're right, uh, 65. 65. Overall rank you. number three, and it was only 65. He was only 65. Yeah. I think it was Vlad. And then, of course, Wander Franco ended up being an 80 grade prospect, which they didn't even, it's not even in this piece because I don't think Fangraphs had graded anyone at 80 at that point. Um, so, uh, anyway, all of that's to say, if you're looking at our screen on YouTube right now, you can see how Fangraphs ranks and values all of these players. Um, to kind of put this in perspective, I've already invoked his name, Fernando Tatis Jr., like we said. Uh, his current contract has an average annual value of two point one, or sorry, twenty one point three million dollars a year on his fourteen year contract. This season, Fernando Tatis has already amassed three point six F WAR, and he's currently projected to eclipse six F WAR by the end of the season. That's somewhere uh, around being worth fifty four to sixty million dollars in true value somewhere between nine and $10 million a win. But he's being paid like he's a 2.4 war player. So if he produces six war, and he's only paid like a 2.4 war player, the difference between that is 3.6 F war. That's all surplus value. So when we say surplus, that's what we're referring to. Um, and so basically, 
I'm going to hand it off to you in a second, John. But b- b- when we have these conversations over the course of the next hour or so, that's what we're going to be talking about is like, how do you reconcile the present value of these people with their potential future value and trying to put this all into context? And this is what like general managers and front office people, this is what they're paid to do. This is their whole job is when they're building rosters. It's trying to figure out how to navigate the ebbs and, f- ebbs and flows of this. So, John, I know you also have some kind of axioms you want to set forth for this conversation. Yeah, because we, we set up this episode in a specific manner, and that manner is that Rafi is kind of the guy that goes over the trades at the time that they were done, and he has a way that he's going to go over that. You'll see. It's going to be interesting. And then I'm going to do more of a, like, post hoc analysis, like after it already happened, what was the actual value that was created, at least given the data that we have so far. And just to set that up, the manner in which I did this was I did that the player value, their the money that they are worth, is a amount of fan graphs value in terms of millions of dollars that they produced at the big at the big league level. And then subtracting the cost of their contract over those years while they were controllable. So you'll see that most of these contracts are just their first six years, the pre-arb and arbitration years. And then in a few spots, gladly not a lot, but in a few spots, there's just a lot of their value is in future value. So sometimes I had to use baseball trade values to try to like get a general scope of how much more value they have going forward. But I'll take that with a grain of salt because it does seem like in order to make up for the fact that some players end up being worth a crap ton of value, like a Tatis Jr., and some are worth very little overall, um, like a Taylor Trammell, they it seems like they try to go with like a median score or a yeah a median score that makes it so that like everybody seems like they're probably a little bit overranked, but I think that's just because they're trying to make up for the fact that like there are outliers that make the you know mean value of it go through much higher than you would expect yes and i also think when we go through our trades and how they looked at the time it's interesting it it kind of brings that question forward of like would you rather be lucky or would you rather be right you know and like i like there are some some of these trades where it's like you want to be lucky every time 100 (laughs) percent. but there are some of these trades where you know i think at the time some of the more contentious trades, let's put it that way, you know what I'm talking about already, uh, that I'm like, at the time, yeah, like, maybe, like, I could, I could talk myself into this, you know, or like, at the time, this didn't look that bad, and then, of course, they aged in one way or another. Um, and for the rest of this so, episode, Rafi will be called the AJ Perler apologist. You will be yes, calling exactly. <laughs> I'm taking, taking on that mantle. Um, oh, man, maybe I need to change my name in the Discord after this comes out. Um, okay. Uh, with that in mind, uh, uh, John is going to zoom through 2015 because I uh, didn't have the time to, to, to set up the 2015 stuff. But uh, there's these are some very quick trades that we're going to cover here, John. Yeah, I kind of skipped this one on my overall analysis as well, just because it was such a kind of nothing uh, like trade deadline. Although... What's funny to think about is that on July 31st, they were actually, in 2015, 50 and 53. They had a 50 and 53 (laughs) record, which (laughs) I don't know if you know this, but that sounds uh, better than our current record. So, I mean, that was a nothing trade deadline based on a very, like, exciting start of the year. I don't know if that reminds you of anything, but we ended up... It does. (laughs) We were all very excited at the beginning of the year. We're recording this on thursday after the padres just lost to the blue jays so if if we just if you're listening to this and we just swept the tigers like fucking a that's great you know but right now we're in sad sad land so i'm gonna assume that we did sweep the tigers just so i can be in a better mood so oh yeah we're just we just swept the tigers congratulations padres um maybe we're up to we're gonna you know on july 31st be only three games under 500 or something like that like in 2015 (laughs) one of the saddest years of our lives but yeah, like I said, not much happened that year. We traded away Abraham Almonte. We traded away Will Venable, future coach. He'll be great one day. Did you know he went to Princeton and played basketball? Did you know that? Rafe, I did, did you know, know he went to actually. Princeton and played <laughs> basketball? I heard that he went to Princeton and played basketball. I just heard that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, so we traded Will Venable uh, and Abraham Almonte in separate trades. The Abraham Almonte trade was to the Cleveland squad that is now known as the Guardians. And we got Mark... Zepchinski, I think is how you would pronounce that. 
Um, and he ended up being uh, pretty terrible for us. He had a 7.36 ERA in 14 innings, so that was just a nothing burger of a trade. And then Will Venable fetched us John Edwards from the Texas Rangers, and John Edwards put up a more respectable 3.35 ERA but his peripherals were such that he actually had a negative F4 because his FIP was 6.04. So, I mean, it was it was, it was was a nothing trade. And you think about it in the context of this season, basically the same record as you would expect us to have, or at least very similar to one. And at that time, after having that very exciting uh, start to the season, this is kind of the season that's most similar in terms of AJ Preller's tenure. And in that particular season... He just made some small trades. He got a couple relievers for very cheap. So I don't know if that's going to be analogous to this season, but it is interesting historical reference point. Yes. And um, before we move on to 2016, I also just want to clarify and note, we are not talking about off-season trades. So yeah. that'll be a different episode, probably in the off-season, to be completely honest. But um, just because, A, it's too much, and uh, B, we just want to keep the focus on, you know, Preller in the deadline mindset and like kind of like what he and his staff have been going after. So I don't it is different. Any it's just wildly different, right? You're building. It's a different wildly squad. different, yeah. wildly different, and uh, let's say maybe a little more uh, level-headed. I don't know. Uh, we'll we'll get into that in a second uh, because uh, 2016, truly in my mind, is the year that like looking back on it the uh, AJ Preller cocaine cowboy uh, kind of myth yeah. was like made for me because there are some absolutely fucking wild trades. <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to start with like the obvious one. Uh, uh, you know, we should all remember June, 2016, uh, the, uh, uh, and a year when the impossible had happened, the improbable has happened. Uh, uh, I'd like to point sexy. out, it's not just yeah. June, 2016. It is June 4th. 4th 2016 which is both claudia my fiance and dean precota my dad's birthday so i think it was fate that we would get tatis jr on that day i say more trades on june 4th that's kind of the result of this episode more trades on june 4th of course this is in the wake of a uh, big sexy bartolo cologne homering off of james shields uh forever shaming him and uh the rest of san diego and the only uh remedy to that was to do a salary dump trade, which it is worth remembering. This is exactly what it was. It was a salary dump. Uh, and uh, in response, we got uh, once touted prospect Eric Johnson and little known international signing Fernando Tatis Jr. So uh, let's talk about the James Shield side of things. He was on a four year, $75 million contract at the time. He was on the second year of that trade. And it was a backloaded contract. So he was still due over $62 million of that $75 million. Um, if you'll remember, he was signed prior to the big 2015 season that went oh so well. Um, and his contract was backloaded basically because they were trying to bring on all of these guys to compete in 2015 and like win now, win now, win now. Hey, take one for the team in 2015. We'll pay you out later. Uh, and of course, that didn't work. So he was having a uh, actually kind of decent uh, year for the Padres. He put up 0.5 F war in the first two months of the season, um, which is not good, uh, but it's not terrible. You know, that still paces out to like 1.5 ish F war uh, over the course of the year. And uh, so, but he was also, I think the biggest contract on the team at the time. And uh, they basically ownership at the time, I think was already Ron Fowler was like, okay, we need to move this guy. So yeah. the Padres traded him to the uh, to the White Sox and they ate half the money. So they were still going to pay him $30 million of that remaining $62 million. Um, so, so hold on. So yeah. I had it as, I, I mean, I did the same kind of thing and I had them as they owed uh, $51 million and we paid $31 million. Okay. I.e., okay. it was $20 million of value for two and a half seasons of James Shields. I think I think the discrepancy is just uh maybe in the half season. Yeah, I including some of that. the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway, but we're in agreement <laughs> that they were eating third something like 30 million dollars. Yeah. Um so uh they were eating 30 million dollars to make James Shields go away. Uh and in return, 
uh, they were getting uh, Eric Johnson, who at one point was ranked to be a 55 overall prospect. Whoa. This is in 2014. Yeah, this is in 2014. Um, uh, so not that much prior to the trade. But what happened was he he got hurt. Um, basically, this is from an article in Sports Illustrated um, that said in 2015, he was considered a bust. However, Red Flag Johnson uh, for regression in 2014, the year before, the White Sox had pushed him 62 and two thirds innings beyond the most he had thrown in a season. So the White Sox like basically like really, really pushed him in 2015 and he got super hurt. Uh, his velocity dipped to somewhere like 89 miles an hour, whereas previously he'd been throwing like 94. And in AAA, he posted a 6.46 ERA. And uh, basically, they shut him down at some point during 2015 due to a sore shoulder. And uh, it was it sucks. It's this is the kind of thing that like really sucks for prospects when you yeah. know they they get hurt and they they just and basically he had come up to the major leagues a few times, pitched a handful of innings, 27, 23, 35 innings in uh 2013 2014 and 2015 and was replacement level the entire time i'm just um, gonna start like i think over yeah. the course of the episode i'm uh, just for a reference point because like i i said whoa when you said 55 overall and i think it's probably good to just like say you know here's a current padre prospect so you can kind of like do an apples to apples so you said 55 future value and i said whoa and that's the reason why is because the two padres current future values on fan graphs at 55 are Ethan Salas and Dylan Lesko. So if you think about like Ethan Salas or Dylan Lesko having a bad season or getting hurt and then like how far the precipitous fall can be, you know? Yeah. Those are some of yeah. our top prospects. And goes back to that axiom of that. There's really no such thing as a pitching prospect. So um, basically what the Padres were trading away in James Shields was uh, projected to be somewhere around let's see hang on i just lost the number of my notes uh they were projecting they're trading away around 45 uh million dollars in projected value uh while they were going to be paying 32 million of it maybe 20 million of it according to our difference but somewhere around there yeah. um so the white Sox, in my calculations were getting somewhere around 13 million dollars in surplus value um and meanwhile in johnson it's, which is a replacement level arm. It was worth about $1 million in surplus value. Um, they were getting this other prospect named Fernando Tatis Jr. Um, John's obviously going to explain how crazily that trade has worked out, but it's worth noting at the time that uh, Tatis was ranked by Eric Longenhagen at the time, on the day this trade happened, article was published as a 40 future value prospect. And uh, I'm going to read directly from the article, but basically, uh, given Tatis's age and proximity to the major leagues, there's obviously a substantial amount of risk here, which suppresses the future value grade below. And the article basically says, look, he's coming to spring training and he's looked great, but the kid is still super young. And like, we just cannot project super. It's the same thing that's happening with Ethan Salas yeah. now, where people are like, which shows you just how good Ethan Salas is, is like this kid's 17 mm -hmm. and he's a 55 future value prospect. And that's us baking in all of the risk that he has because like this kid could literally, you know, who, who knows? Who knows what happened to him? So much is going to time is between now and when he uh, debuts in the major leagues. So Tatis at the time as a 40 future value ranking was worth only $2 million in surplus value. So if you grade it out in terms of uh, surplus value, the Padres were trading away $13 million in surplus and getting back three. So it's a quote unquote losing trade, but you have to remember at the time that was not the objective of the trade. The objective was ownership was like, stop spending money. So yeah, yeah you're going to basically, they were giving James Shields away for basically nothing to make him go away and save some money on him, somewhere between 20 and $30 million on him. So um, that's the thought process around what was happening at the trade. John, what has happened since? <laughs> So I, I want to keep up with my theme of just giving an apples to apples. So 40, 40 future value prospects in our system right now. Uh, a lower variance one is Aggie Rosario. And then a higher variance one is Graham Pauly, who is uh, in high A right now and is kind of killing it. He has a 147 WRC plus last year or in single A this year, he also had a 143 WRC plus. So he's, he's been around 150 at all stops, but he's still only 22 in, in high A, Graham Pauly, a 40 future grade prospect. That's our next Tatis, in case you were wondering. 
Um, <laughs> st- so I, I just wanted to point out because I, I was able to find an article that was talking about uh, it was a Dennis Lynn article that was referencing what Preller and Chris Kemp, the scouting director, were talking about when they when they saw Tatis in when he was 16 years old in the same class as Vladimir Guerrero and Juan Soto. And I mean, I, I just want to express that I'm pretty damn sure that Tatis was a fun throw in. He was a lottery ticket because, I mean, A.J. Pre- Preller at the time or yeah, A.J. Preller called him. Like, he referred back to his thoughts on him in, in the international signing class and called him a skinny, young tryout kid, basically. <laughs> Which is... <laughs> that's not a ringing endorsement. A skinny, young tryout kid, basically. And then, yeah, so they... Both him and, and Chris Kemp had similar evaluations, it was, although Chris Kemp's was more positive. Preller kind of called him, like, gangly, lanky, skinny... And then his positive aspects were that he had a frame that you could put weight on and then see what happens, kind of. Yeah. Whereas whereas Chris Kemp said, yeah, he's gangly, but he has like a 7-3, 60-yard dash. So he's like, he's quick for somebody who's like 15 and a half, 16. Um, and, you know, maybe, like his was a little bit more more positive. Although at the same time, he was kind of calling him a lean, lanky kid. Either way, I did hear that Chris Kemp ended up kind of pushing for him. But it sounds like it was like a Chris Kemp pet project that was just like, and get him to throw in this. And thank God AJ Preller did, because it created obviously an insane amount of surplus value. So like I said, I'm I, I just going to go over this one more time. I, I do my, my evaluation based on how much value Fangraph said that they created for the Padres, subtracting how much money the Padres had to pay him, and then adding in any future value if you have to. So... James Shields ended up, when you add his value that he created for us, or created for the White Sox, and hit the contract that took away, like, took away that value, obviously, because they only had to pay $20 million of the $51 million. Um, it ended up being that he created negative $3.3 million for the White Sox, because he was a negative war player for the White Sox overall, and that cost the White Sox $20 million. So if you think about him as a White Sox, he cost them twenty million, and his on-field performance was worth negative three point three million. Thus, he basically ended up costing the White Sox overall, just having him on the team, twenty three point three million. So it was a salary dump, and it worked. We could have traded him for nobody, and it would have ended up, you know, being valuable just because they. I mean, even if you have to pay him twenty million, and he's terrible, then you're losing a lot of money, right? And so part of that is our fault for signing him in the first place. We did give him. A uh, huge contract, four years. He got ten million his first year, and then twenty one million every year after that. So we were paying him the big bucks for him to do essentially nothing. He was in his like age thirty four, thirty five, thirty six years, and obviously it didn't work out. But you know, cut your losses. We did cut our losses. That's a you know that's a good skill to have when you are in over your head and you cut your losses when you can. We did that. Great job, AJ Preller. And then we got. Eric Johnson ended up doing nothing, but we also got Fernando Tatis Jr. And Fernando Tatis Jr. has obviously been extraordinarily valuable. Just to this point in his career so far, he's generated, according to Fangraphs, $137.7 million worth of value. And he's only cost us $21 million so far, and $10 million of that was just his signing bonus. And then I did have to do his future value because his contract does, in retrospect, look amazing going forward. And so he ends up being worth six or two hundred and sixty eight million in terms of surplus value. And then you add in the negative, which makes it a positive, right? You're subtracting the negative. We ended up in that trade making a total of two hundred and eighty five million dollars of surplus value. Two hundred and eighty five million dollars of surplus value is what a Tatis trade will do for you. My God, like, oh, my that's that's. A franchise turning around trade right there. And honestly, a AJ Preller saving job, probably in retrospect, because like that is a highlight of his tenure. A hundred percent. I mean, again, it's like it's the one um people will always point to it. You know, it's it's going to be the second or third sentence in his obituary, if not the first. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like the guy who pulled off the Tatis trade, like 
it's and it's the yeah it's like you're saying like people are constantly any preller apologist of which i am one apparently for this episode <laughs> um, is going to say but he traded for tatis and i mean like if anything what it it shows and it, it it's a kind of quintessential to the aj preller approach is toolsy upside guys because yeah. the potential is tatis theoretically now tatis is like a generational talent so i don't you know i i don't think you you should expect that these guys can turn into tatis but you get you trade for these prospects who have like incredibly wide error bars and yeah. uh you know they lead to like incredibly varying results um and uh you know we'll get to taylor Trammell in a second but he was someone who was once thought of to be very high and hasn't turned out in in, in the same way but he's kind of a toolsy sort of guy um uh, I just really want to. I want to know so yeah. much. How, how, like, what is in Chris Kemp and Logan White's brains right now? If they're just like, dude, your whole career is basically based on my recommendation to you, and you just like agree to it on a whim. Which I feel like, kind of based on the discrepancy between their evaluations, is kind of probably how it happened. I, I think that AJ Peller should sign them to at least lifetime contracts worth a lot of money. <laughs> if they want it <laughs> hey listen they still work there i'm sure they got know, know. other teams so they're still there they're aj's guys uh i'm just reminded of that scene from mad men have you seen mad men yeah i don't yeah. think i've seen it all do you remember do you remember the that's what the money's for speech where peggy's like mad that she that don isn't giving her credit on an ad and she he's like that's what the money's for that's why i get i pay you money you give me uh, ideas yeah, 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 you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's just that's preller's that's like kemp's for. like kemp's like i signed tattoos he's like that's what the money's for <laughs> <laughs> but it's, the money's not enough I just the got money's not enough then you fucking leave billion dollars worth of well, value chris kemp <laughs> like peggy olsen could just leave. <laughs> you know she could leave and go to, he can go to another ad agency uh anyway all right that's the end of Mad Men corner for this episode um i didn't we'll have see, we'll time see. to go into the fernando rodney chris paddock trade like you did but fucking a do you just want to like talk about that because that's yes. crazy it's hilarious so first of all fernando rodney had a great first half i feel like everybody remembers this where he was just like dominating i think he gave up like one earned run the whole first half it ended up being 28.2 innings which is obviously a very very few innings and he he had a 0 0.31 ERA, so yeah, that that calculates out to one e one earned run that he gave up. And I mean, the FIP was 2.31, xFIP 3.24, which shows that like, I mean, he's not gonna not give up a run the rest of the year, but he's had a good year, and the rest of his career was not like that. So like, I don't know what you're paying for, but it just goes to show like, I mean, an analogous thing would be Hater this year, except for Hater has way more of a track record of being good yeah i mean he doesn't have a 0 0.31 era to be fair but you know it, fernando Roddy versus josh Hader is no contest right and that got us chris paddock and chris paddock is somebody who i feel like padres fans love to hate because he did give up a lot of homers and we always thought he was going to be great and he ended up being only okay but he gave us a lot of value. And this kind of value is something that I feel like us as fans can really feel right now. Like, Chris Paddock makes it so that Ryan Weathers doesn't pitch. You know, Chris Paddock makes yeah. it so that Reese Kinnear doesn't pitch. And that can be a, that can be a huge de deviance in terms of, like, how, like, your ability to win that game. When Reese Kinnear starts, I feel like the whole locker room just shuts down. Because we never win the Reese Kinnear start. We rarely, we seldom win the, the Ryan Weathers start. But, you know, having Chris Paddock, who had a, you know, 4.2 ERA overall in his career so far, is valuable. You put up 5.5 war so far in his career, he's valuable. And that was for a rental season, so we got a ton of value. Hold on. I think my thing got pushed out away where... I'm just going to uh, backfill really quickly while you're looking for your notes. Just let me know if you end up finding them. But I was able to uh, look at what Chris Paddock's prospect evaluation was at the time of this trade. Okay, sweet. At, at the beginning of the 2016 season, um, he was ranked as a 50 grade future value prospect. Um, so what the Marlins thought that they were getting in Fernando Rodney was the best reliever in baseball. And they thought they were going to get him for uh, roughly three months. And so based on the way he was playing, you know, he put up 
0.8 F war uh, in the beginning of the season. Uh, so, you know, I'm assuming that they were going to bake in some regression. They didn't think he was going to have literally one earned run given up over the next three months. Um, but assuming he puts up half of a win, um, you know, a 50 future value pitching prospect uh, is worth in present war when you're trading 0.4 yeah. present war. So this is like, again, it's kind of like a, a, it's a really weird, I, even I, sometimes when I try and articulate it, it's like kind of hard for me to express. But basically the idea is, is that a 50 future value pitching prospect, given all of their risk, given the fact that they wouldn't be giving you any of their value until the future, um, all of that, et cetera, et cetera. If you basically do what Fangraphs does and tries to say, okay, if I were to be trading away, you know, this much present war, what would a 50 future value prospect be worth in return? Like that I can kind of justify it in my head and, and try and equate these things. A 50 future value pitching prospect is worth about 0.4 present war. Now, when you think about, again, the organizational depth chart of things, a 50 future value pitching prospect is super valuable. You know what I mean? Like that's a, that's in the future, a potential like regular everyday starter. Um, I think a 50 future value prospect is, is generally graded by Fangraphs to be projected to be like a four starter, which it's kind of like what you're saying. It's like that avoids a Ryan Weathers start that avoids a Reese Kinnear, you know, spot start a Matt Waldron spot start is by having one of these guys in your org who's ready to shuttle back and forth between AAA or potentially stay in the major leagues. So um, when you look at the trade at the time, it's kind of crazy to think that like, oh my God, they're trading away six years of Chris Paddock for, yeah. for three months of Fernando Rodney. But then when you think about, again, they don't have crystal balls like we do. And looking back on these, that actually this is about an equivalent amount of, few, of present war that is being given up based on these two things. Um, and that's, again, this is the whole reason why rebuilding teams sell their guys. This is the whole reason. Like, because again, present war and future war are different prospects. And present war is worthless to a rebuilding team. It doesn't yeah. mean shit because it's not going to get you anywhere right now. But future war is super important. So, and future war has lots of risk baked in and it has lots of uh, potential downsides and everything like that. But th this is why teams operate the way that they do. Um, did you find what you're looking for? Or should we move on? Yeah, I found it. Uh, it got deleted, but I do remember it. So, and just just going off what you were saying was a uh, 50 grade prospect. We don't actually have a 50 grade prospect in our in our system right now. But Jairo Iriarte is 45 plus, and Dylan Lesko, like I said before, was 55, which is what Chris Paddock ended up graduating with in the next off season. Um, so right after that, he ended up being basically Dylan Lesko, but somewhere between Dylan Lesko and Jairo Iriarte at the time, which is obviously a very valuable prospect. Like if, if I could offer you a second Jairo Iriarte for the rest of this season for Josh Hader, you'd probably take it. And we got that for Fernando Rodney, but okay. So what, what ended up happening was, like I said, Fernando Rodney was great for us. He ended up being terrible for the Marlins. He had a five point. 8.9 ERA, ended up having a negative war, so ended up having negative value overall. Uh, he was cheap, but he still had negative overall value for them. And then Chris Paddock has been worth $44.3 million so far. If you subtract out his contract, it ends up being about $42.5 million or so. And then he has a little bit of future value, but then he signed a contract, which makes it kind of confusing but also you know he's going to be hurt and he's probably not going to provide much more value over the six years of the six controllable years that you would have had and so either way it ends up being that you got about somewhere like 42 45 million positive for that fernando rodney trade so we're up to 285 million for the tatis trade and about 45 million for the fernando rodney trade in the same off season yeah so, uh, or not off season in the same trade, trade deadline, same, same mid season. Yeah. Um, next up on the list is, uh, Drew Pomerantz. Remember Drew Pomerantz? Uh, no. 
Uh, <laughs> Drew, Drew Pomeranz, who uh, was last seen with a uh, suitcase of cash jumping out of a plane somewhere over the Pacific <laughs> Northwest, um, is, uh, if you if, believe it or not, was a starting pitcher at one point. It was a starting pitcher for our San Diego Padres. And uh, he, uh, in 2016, it was his first year with the Padres. Preller had pulled off a weird trade with the A's that involved Jabari Blash uh, to pull out another name from the past. Who will be great season. someday if he ever locks and taps into his power? <laughs> he will still be. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, this podcast is a Jabari Blash Truther Hour. Um, bring your own tinfoil. Uh, so uh, Drew Pomeranz, at the time that he was traded to the uh, Boston Red Sox on July 14th, 2016, he had two and a half years remaining of team control. And uh, at the time, you know, he was having an unbelievable season. He was an all-star, if you'll remember that, for the Padres. Uh, the year that they hosted the all-star game in 2016, he put up 2.4 uh, F4 um, for the San Diego Padres in the first half of 2016. And uh, so kind of projecting that out, he was projected to be worth another win above replacement for the rest of 2016. And then baking in his discounted future projected war for 2017 and 2018, he was projected to be worth 2017, a, or 2.7 war in 2017 and 2.4 war in 2018. Um, that's including the future discounts. So all of that's to say at the time of the trade, he was worth 6.1 present 2016 war. Okay. Um, and when you think about the fact that uh, he was in his R beers, he, you're essentially, if you're the Red Sox, getting those 6.1 present war at a 50% discount because in your first R beer, you're basically paid somewhere between a quarter and a third of what you're going to go for on the open market. Your second R beer, somewhere around half, and then your third R beer, somewhere around three quarters. Uh, so you add all that up, you're getting a 50% discount on those three years. Um, so uh, yeah, Drew Pomeranz was going to be very cheap and productive for the Red Sox. That's what they're thinking at the time of the trade. So, in response, um, the Padres got a pitching prospect named Anderson Espinoza, which, if you'll remember, it, he's still in the system, right? He came back. He came back, yeah. Yes. So He, ha he has uh, a 6.19 ERA in AAA, in case you're wondering. He has a 6.19 ERA in AAA. But at the time, Anderson Espinoza was literally getting Pedro Martinez comparisons. Pedro and, uh, Martinez. Yes. My God. Um, and uh, in an article that Eric Longenhagen wrote at the time of the trade, uh, basically, he was given a 60 future value <laughs> ranking. And uh, this is what he said about those level of prospects. 60 future value prospects usually ro uh, fall in the 10 to 25 range on the top 100 um, and uh, give or take a few spots depending on the strength of that year's class. Considering the height of Espinoza's ceiling, I think he belongs towards the top of that range. Now, oh once God. again, putting all of this into context, a 60 future value pitching prospect, according to fan graphs, is worth 6.7 present war. Okay, so remember that concept we talked about earlier, future war is worth less than present war and it decays, and etc. We don't need to go back into that. So. <laughs> Even given all of the volatility and all of the craziness that comes with the prospect, a 60 future value pitching prospect is worth 6.7 present war. That's $60 million in value that a single prospect is worth. So all of that's to say is that on a present war basis, um, the Padres are actually coming out on top in this trade. They are they are trading 6.1 present war away to receive 6.7 present war in terms of prospect capital strength. Um, so uh, this was a at the time a good trade or at least a very defensible trade from AJ Preller. So uh, everything's worked out, right? Anderson Espinosa turned into Pedro Martinez, right? Wrong, you AJ Preller defender. Wow, oh, just going on wrong again. whatever, whatever suits your statistics, huh? You little AJ Preller defender. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it, yeah, because at the time, I think we were all excited about it, and I mean, it was a, it was a, it was an interesting trade, right? Pomeranz yeah. was valuable at the time, and Anderson Espinosa was valuable at the time, and 
Pomeranz was controllable. He had two and a half more years. He, over those two and a half years, Arb controlled, only made $13.4 million in total. And he had a really good year in 2017 for, for Boston, ended up having $23.7 million worth of value just in that year alone because he was dominating. He had three F4 that year with 332 ERA. But overall, because he was only mediocre for them at the second half of the 2016 season and then was terrible in the 2018 season, Fangrass values him as during his Red Sox tenure worth $25.4 million. And then if you subtract away the $13.4 million that he earned, he was worth about $12 million in terms of surplus value. Obviously, Anderson Espinoza has never been worth anything in terms of surplus value, but value he was worth something. I think he ended up getting this Jake Marisnik, if I remember correctly. That's correct. But in, in terms of surplus value, uh, he never, so just like looking at this trade one for one, he didn't get anything. So for that trade, according to how things went as of now, unless he's good going forward, which I really don't think he will be. He, we had lost that trade by $12 million, $12 million to $0 million. So, and it's worth, we should mention, like, Anderson Espinosa, what happened was he was hurt constantly. He had Tommy John. Did he have two Tommy Johns or just one? I think, I, I think that he had two post-trade. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, he was, he was hurt all the time. He was just constantly, constantly hurt. And again, that, that's that axiom of there's no such thing as a pitching prospect that people like to, to tout constantly. It's that, uh, these guys their arms blow up and uh, you know, more and more, especially as guys throw harder and harder, more arms are going to explode. And yeah, so um, two, two consecutive pitching appearances. His last one was for us in 2016. And then his next one was for the Cubs in 2021 in high a ball. Wow. Yeah. It's it. So, I mean, again, I'm like seriously rooting for the guy. If he can make any sort of major league career as a reliever, or whatever, just, you know, it's, uh, it's great uh, that, that, you know, I'm, I'm really pulling for him, but he's a, uh, yeah, go ahead. And I forgot to do the future value thing. Uh, 60 future value is equal to Jackson Merrill above Ethan Salas and Dylan Lesko at this time. Nice. So that gives you a sense of just how valuable he was. So, all right, now we're starting to get into the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, we're going to come back to something about the Pomeranz trade because it, it becomes relevant after the next trade we're going to talk about. Um, which is that on July 29, 2016, the, uh, uh, the Miami Marlins having not gotten spanked enough by the Fernando Rodney trade came back to AJ <laughs> Pellet for more, um, like and, fools, said, you fools. And, and said, we want, we, we want to go back into business. And on July 29th, uh, the, it, it, it should be said the Marlins at the time, they were 55 and 48. So they're seven games over 500. They are six games back in the division. They're only one game out of the wild card. So they're like, we need to go on a run. And they were uh, really low on pitching, on starting pitching depth. So um, theoretically, they'd be willing to pay a premium for that starting pitching depth. Um, and so the Padres said, we will do that for you. And they traded Andrew Kashner, Tehran Guerrero, and Colin Rea and some cash to the Miami Marlins. And in return, they received Carter Caps, Jared Cosart, Josh Naylor, old friend alert, and Luis Castillo. And you might be wondering, that Luis Castillo, the Mariners ace, Luis Castillo? Yes, that's Luis Castillo. He was a San Diego Padres prospect for two days. Because what happened on July 30th, is that Colin Ray, a day after he was traded, made a start for the Miami Marlins, and in the third inning, left the game with an elbow injury. The Marlins were furious. They accused, basically accused Preller of wrongdoing, saying that they were, that he was, you know, they had been sold damaged goods, and they, you know, implying some sort of treachery on AJ Preller's part. Um, and... So the uh, Preller trait basically said, okay, let's, let's like, we'll make this go away. And this is voluntary. 
Okay, this is the thing that blew me away because in my uh. mind he was forced to do this. This was voluntary. They voluntarily traded Colin Rea back to the Padres after he had been injured and gave back Luis Castillo to the Marlins. Okay? So this is what I'm talking about where I'm like, this is the legend of AJ Preller is being made in this, in this one season. So, okay. Here's the thing. Andrew, Ka- we, we just talk about the, Andrew Kashner was a rental. Andrew Kashner was going to be a free agent. He had put up, uh, you know, he'd been replacement level so far in the year. He had a preseason projected of 1.5 war. So, you know, the rest of the season, two months left, you, you can say he'd be worth somewhere around half of a win that the Marlins could be getting from. But again, they're they're looking for for pitching depth. They're looking for like a four starter. And that was what Kaushner was like going to be able to provide. Um, Colin Ray, uh, he was, uh, had just, this was, he was only in his second year in the majors. And so what you were getting with him, he was a kind of a non-prospect. He was kind of, he actually hadn't gotten ranked as a prospect in the in the most recent prospect evaluation before he was called up, but he was basically grading and playing like a 45 future value prospect. Um, so uh, I, I kind of tend to think of him that way um, because he still had five years of control left at the time he was theoretically traded. And Tehran Guerrero was a replacement level reliever. So like the Padres were trading away kind of nothing. Like kind of yeah. nothing, um, which is like I understand that if you're the Marlins, like, and you just need guy like warm bodies to like eat innings, like this is a trade that makes sense. Um, but uh, you know, at at the time, uh, they traded Carter Caps to the Padres. Carter Caps was had was missing that whole year with an elbow injury, so he was going to be unavailable. Uh, but he had looked good as a reliever in 2015. Uh, he had a 1.16 ERA in 31 innings. Before he got and hurt. the weirdest, the weirdest delivery any of us have ever seen. He had the hop delivery, right? Yeah, he was the hop guy. Yeah. So, yeah, for, yeah John, you want to explain what that was? Yeah. So, <laughs> at the time, I guess nobody had ever done it, so there wasn't a rule for it. I think, but it was basically like he had his foot on the rubber, so he was technically starting his windup in a legal position, and then he would do the normal, like, very long windup or very long stretch uh, extension, but then he would do a hop, which got him about another foot closer to the plate, which obviously makes all his extension data way better and overall his like pitch quality way better. And then there was a weird thing where he got hurt and then he went to the minors and then they made a rule where nobody else is allowed to do that except him. But then he was like confused on whether he was going to be allowed to do it once he got back to the MLB. And then so he started to try to pitch without it. And then he never ended up being anything. So I don't know. I don't know what ended up happening in terms of like if he ever did a try for the. I don't even know if he's technically allowed to do it in AAA at the time. So if he was even allowed to practice it, but it ended up that he was like a novelty pitcher, and they made a ruling against the novelty that probably hurt his career. Yeah. So I got to remember him if there's ever a, a Marlins, uh, Mariners, Padres, Immaculate Grid pick. He he played for all three teams doing that weird little crow hop. Uh, so yeah, uh, and then Jared Cosart was also a uh, he was originally a starter and then you know kind of was hurt and bounced around or whatever. But he was you know basically replacement level. He had a he had a two war season for split across the Astros and the Marlins in uh, 2014, but basically did nothing outside of that. Um, and then Josh Naylor uh, at the time. He was ranked as a 50 value prospect. He had uh, just been drafted um, and he was coming out of Canada. And basically the, the scouting report was, uh, you know, his ceiling was ranked as a regular first baseman. His floor was a platoon power off the bench. This is from uh, a scouting report uh, from baseball prospectus. And they called him Naylor is a bad body first baseman with power and hitting tools you can't teach. Uh, That's fat shaming. That is absolutely fat shaming. We do not agree with that on this podcast, but it, it, it is it is the sort of old school. It's just that kind of like weird gray period where we still had kind of old school scouting in 2016. There are some guys who are like, he's a bad body first baseman with power and hitting tools you just can't teach. Uh, which is like... I guess. I guess what I was trying to say was that, like, he's a first baseman or DH. I don't know why he had to throw in the bad body, but okay. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but uh, 
whatever. I don't know what weird shit was happening <laughs> back then. Uh, anyway, he was a 50 uh, value prospect. This is not ranked by fan graphs. There wasn't a fan graph ranking at the time. Um, but I'm just going to use the equivalent and say that that's worth about 3.1 present war. That's what a, fu- a 50 future value prospect is worth. Um, Luis Castillo, however, he was kind of originally projected to be a relief pitcher because he only had a fastball and a slider. And then he had a changeup that he had just introduced. But all of the scouts were like, this dude telegraphs his changeup like every time and it's not going to develop. Uh, spoiler alert, it fucking did. Uh, but it um, very much did. But uh, and so he got his kind of first really good scouting report uh, right before this trade. And this scouting report happened on May 2016. And he, his fastball was sitting 97 to 99. Slider uh, was uh, ranked as 60 overall future grade slider. It was sitting 82, 84. Changeup sitting 87, 89. Um, and he was given a 60 overall ranking by this prospect or by this uh, scout um, in May of 2016. And once again, it's worth remembering a 60 future value prospect. That's what Anderson Espinosa was ranked as. Uh, and that's six or 6.7 present war. So again, again, this is, this is a perfect example of like the range of stuff we get. You have yeah. two sixty future value prospects. One of them turns into literally Luis Castillo. And then the yeah. other turns into a guy who never does anything. And like, that's, that's what we're dealing with when we're trying to make these guesses. Um, so if the trade had gone through as planned, Preller, this would have been an absolute Preller fleece job. Okay, yep. we would have been giving away 1.0 present war in exchange for 9.8 present war. Okay, that is so insanely imbalanced. Um, of course, that's not what happened, and they had to trade back uh, Rea and uh, and <laughs> Castillo. So uh, it ended up being uh, 0.6 present value F4 that was being given away, and we receiving 3.1. That's still a great trade. Um, you know, that's still a great because Naylor was still ranked as this like really good bat, uh, but it uh, is not what it could be. And uh, the, the, by the way, before I hand it over to you to talk about this trade, this is what's important about this trade and why I said the Pomeranz trade is going to come back. At the end of the season, AJ Preller was suspended for 30 days without pay by Major League Baseball for for hiding information about Drew Pomeranz's medical records when he was traded to the Red Sox. So so this is what makes this so intriguing to me because <laughs> he wasn't actually disciplined for the Colin Rea trade. He was disciplined for the Pomeranz trade. But I think he was doing something sketchy in the Rea trade because why would he agree to trade it yeah, back for Luis nobody would, Castillo? Nobody would agree. Yeah, no. He's like, oh, no, 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 it's okay. Out of the kindness of his own heart. It's okay, it's okay. Don't worry, we'll trade it back. Uh, you know, Literally, you have to go back and read it. Preller says something like along the lines of like, oh, we just wanted to make it right or something like that. Or you're like, are you fucking serious? Like, we are in, we are in major, welcome to the major leagues, baby. We're playing hardball. <laughs> we don't do like good deals for friends. Yeah, like, like, here you go. We were, yeah, we were exactly. Just for so. future trades we're gonna give you somebody who's could be great for nothing for a guy anyway. with a current tommy john injury oh my god <laughs> yeah what the anyway. hell you so know i want to know that story i want to know that story so bad like what yeah. the fuck happened like yeah there, what? you you he traded somebody who could be great for somebody who literally currently has tommy john when he didn't need it when we traded him. Yeah. So you know whatever he did was like shady as fuck. Cause like, why, it was so why would fucking you, <laughs> shady. <laughs> why this, would you do so There's insane. no way you would agree to that trade unless it was like his job was on the line. So let's find out, podcast fans, how much AJ Preller's job is worth it to Padres. Okay, let's get it into this trade. Like you're 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 selling that Cashner Guerrero and Rayo were basically worth nothing, and that is in fact true. Cashner ended up providing about $2 million of surplus value. Guerrero was negative $6.4 million because he had negative war, which is, uh, I mean, part of, partly the teams who had him's fault for playing him in the first place, so I don't know whether you should include that, but I did anyway. So Tehran Guerrero ended up being worth negative $6.4 million, and Colin Ray ended up being worth $1.3 million, which at, in total we gave them negative $3.1 million. Which, when we as Padres fans go, oh, everybody we trade for at the deadline ends up being terrible for us, and we, you know, that sucks. There's a lot of instances that I saw through this, like, going through all these trades, where the other team also got nothing at all when they were trying to, like, 
shore up their depth or whatever. Like, for example, the Marlins trying to go for the postseason that year, get negative $3.1 million worth of value, and give up Luis Castillo. So let's talk about Luis Castillo. Luis Castillo has been worth, during his... I, I only did the years that he would have been controllable for us, because he did sign a, like, a, a contract with Seattle afterwards. So I'm not counting that at all. I'm just saying, during the years in which he would have played for us, if we would have had him... The six years, uh, pre-arb and then arb, he generated one hundred and forty-five point five million dollars worth of Fangraphs value based on his WAR, and then was paid thirteen point two million, which adds up to one hundred and thirty-two point three million dollars of surplus value. One hundred and thirty-two point three million dollars of surplus value, which I will call an amount that is almost half of a Tatis. That is half of a Tatis worth of excess value which is obviously a lot of surplus value. And then he got Josh Naylor. Josh Naylor is one of these ones where I have to rely on the baseball trade values for some of his value. He's already generated $26.5 million and was paid $7.9 million. So he's already been in excess value of nearly $20 million. But he does have a value going forward that baseball trade values, which, you know, take it with a grain of salt or whatever, they regard him as worth about $22.1 million of surplus value. Um, if you do my whole calculation as a whole, he's worth $42.8 million in surplus value. Jared Kozart was worth $2 million, whatever. So that ends up being that we got in that trade $176.9 million of surplus value, and we traded away negative 3.1 surplus value which gives us about $180 million total of surplus value. $180 million of surplus value is an insane amount of surplus value. Not quite a Fernando Tatis trade, but in the same order of magnitude. But then, right after the trade deadline, we had to give back the Colin Ray for Castillo trade. And that ended up being $132.3 million worth of surplus value for zero surplus value now because he didn't make that one start for the for the Marlins which ended up being a 0.2 F4 start. It was actually a good start. He had no earned runs allowed over 3.1 innings I think before it, his his UCL snapped and even his FIP was great so like he ended up being worth what I think it was like 1.2 million, 1.3 million in that start alone. The one that he broke his UCL on. And then, so you take that away from us, the $132.3 million, now we're only $47.7 million in surplus value, which is still a lot, but oh my god, it seems like for some shady shit that AJ Preller was doing, we literally traded $132.3 million for $0 million. Is he worth $132.3 <laughs> million in your hearts? Fans, you decide for yourself. Well, um, we're going to, uh, that, that's the last trade of, of 2016 that we're going to talk about. Uh, so in 2017 and 2018, there were some sort of kind of nothing trades. Hold on. Uh, yeah. what, one thing I, I just wanted to add it all up. Cause we, we also tra- traded Kemp for Oliver, Oliveira, I guess his name was, uh, just as a salary dump in 2016. Yeah. Um, and Kemp was terrible. So it ended up being worth $17.9 million in terms of Padre savings. Just trust my math on that one. Or don't, but that's what I calculated it as being. And so that means that in the 2016 offseason, we, because all of these happened in the same season, we're still talking about the same offseason, which is crazy. Midseason. Uh, Mid-season. Those all, all, oh, sorry. Same trade deadline. Um, we ended up getting $382.4 million in surplus value, all in this one trade deadline. And it would have been over five hundred million if the Castillo trade actually happened. Um, fucking crazy. Well, you know, yeah, again, crazy, AJ Preller, yeah. AJ Preller, cocaine cowboy is. Uh, he is killed it that, that year. Yeah, he really did. Um, <laughs> and also, again, if you know, we want to have an overall Preller conversation. He's a good rebuilding GM because, like, he it knows seems as though he is. He knows everyone's dudes better than they know their dudes. And like, that's such an asset to have. The trouble is we're not rebuilding anymore. So anyway, that's, we don't need to get started on that. 
Um, a, a secondary thing to that is that it seems like you need a lot of lottery tickets because when you when you're selecting based on people who could someday be great, like a Fernando Tatis Jr. or a Luis Castillo. I mean, Luis Castillo. When I was talking about uh, prospect evaluations before, I said like you probably don't want to spend a lot of money on somebody who hasn't shown that they can spin a baseball. And Luis Castillo never showed that he could spin a baseball. And he just developed that change up out of nowhere but that nobody was expecting. And that's what caused his value to soar. I mean, I think it was just pure luck. But, like, if if you're valuing these, like, skills overall, then you probably need a lot of lottery tickets. So not only do we need a chance... Like, I don't, I don't know if he's great at evaluating prospects, but he's great if you give him, like, a hundred shots like he's great at having three of those turn out yeah to be really good yeah um 2017 and 2018 the only trade that i want to talk about is the brad hands francisco mejia trade um do you want to just quickly speed through any of that stuff i mean what did you have on it um well uh at the time um you know, I was just reading through a Fangraphs article that was written about the trade contemporaneously, and everyone was like, "This is a huge price that the uh, at the time Cleveland Indians are paying for and for Adam Simber and Brad Hand." That Francisco Mejia was uh, in the yeah. most recent prospect update at the time of that was graded by Eric Loggenhagen as being a sixty future value prospect uh, as a position player which again is worth something around 6.1 uh, present war uh, or uh, $55 million in terms of 2018 dollars whenever that article was written, uh, which is also the same year this trade happened. Uh, so, uh, and Brad Hand at the time, you know, was putting up about 1.5 year F4 a year as a reliever. Um, so with two and a half years left of control at the time he was traded, uh, you know, you can say that, okay, you know, that's worth somewhere along four war. Um, so, you know, yeah. with Adam Simber baked in, uh, it's a pretty kind of even-ish trade, but you could even maybe argue that at the time the Padres were coming out on top um, and in just in terms of like present war prospect to current value, et cetera, et cetera, translation. Um, and I don't believe that that's how the trade played out. I think it played no. out a little bit more in Cleveland's favor. It was close. It was. It, I think it's a. It's a fair. You know, sometimes like a wash. it rolls the wrong way, but it was. It was fair. So I, I had Brad Hand as being worth over the next few years thirteen point five million dollars in excess value, and then Adam Simber as four point five million, Mejia as eleven point seven million, and it ended up being that the Guardians had a win of about six million dollars, which it seems like that was just like. You know, Mejia wasn't quite as good as we thought. And, you know, six six million is not a huge loss. That's just, that was a fair gamble, I think. I do want to talk real quick about one thing that I thought just was really interesting from like a historical perspective. We did also trade Phil Hughes and because he had a bad contract, basically, we had to pay him $7.25 million to provide us negative $2 million worth of value in order to get a competitive B balance, uh, a competitive balance b draft pick and we ended up getting someone sometimes that's hard to tell because it's like you get a certain amount of money but we actually signed this player for their slot value and that was grant little so we ended up paying uh 9.25 in total value 7.25 just for the phil hughes contract and then two million dollars for how bad he was for grant little and then obviously he didn't end up being anything so in total that officer that i keep saying that that uh trade deadline we ended up losing about 15 million dollars in value got it um 2019 um i didn't do anything for this trade um we can talk about the Tramel trade if you want um up to you yeah, let's go choice. real quick through it so okay, cool. so this is the this is this is the year of uh bad reliever evaluations i think because we traded away or we traded four Matt Whistler, who was like our like a huge prospect for us before, and I think he was part of the like Max Freed deal for Upton, but I think he was a first round pick. He was either a first or second round pick. And he came back to us and we were like trying to bank on him being able to throw a slider in like an Austin Adams type manner where he just like throws it a million times because it was a really good slider. And he provided one million uh dollars in value for us, and then we DFA'd him. And unfortunately, he created $15 million in value 
while he was still like ARB and pre-ARB for other teams that we just missed out on because we didn't evaluate him properly, I guess. And then also Phil Maton, we got rid of for interno- international bonus slot money. He ended up providing almost $10 million, $9.8 million in a value excess. Got rid of Alex Dickerson, and I feel like everybody remembers that he had like that hot year and a half for the Giants. He ended up being uh, $5.2 value. $5.2 million in excess value. Uh, and then another reliever, Brad Wick, ended up giving up $3 million in total value. We gave him away for Carl Edwards, who did nothing for us. And then there was that that interesting trade, which was Framil Reyes and Logan Allen for Taylor Trammell, basically. Uh, Trevor Bauer and Yasiel Puig were also in that trade, however, not really involved with our aspect of the trade. That ended up being... Uh, Greg Allen had a negative $2.5 million valuation. Uh, Framil Reyes was very good for the first two years and, in fact, put up uh, $16.2 million worth of value, but then ended up being worth negative value. Taylor Chermel has been worth $3 million. So, in total, we ended up winning that trade, I guess, technically by $8 million. But overall, in that offseason or that trade deadline, we lost about eight point six million. Once again, close to even. Didn't really add or add or lose. Well, um, with that in mind, Oof. we're gonna head on to twenty twenty. Um, so I'll bring up. This is good actually because I can talk about Tramel in the in the Nola trade. Um, yeah. But uh, basically, in twenty twenty, we're gonna we're gonna kind of just kind of speed through to uh, you know. There were a few trades that happened. Uh, we we traded for uh, uh, Jorge Mateo. We got him. It's not really worth talking about. Uh, the Tim Hill trade happened that year. We traded away uh, Toolsy God, Franchi Cordero, and Ronald Bolaños <laughs> uh, to the Kansas City Royals in return for uh, everyone's favorite uh, Risp uh, Strander, sometimes Tim Hill. Uh, and then uh, on August 29th, 2020, a reminder, this is the COVID year, so the trade deadline was pushed back a month. Um, we uh, received Trevor Rosenthal uh, in a trade also from the Kansas City Royals. Um, and on August 30th, we traded for Mitch Moreland and traded away, excuse me, Jason Rosario and Hudson Potts. Hudson Potts is someone who was a really big uh, prospect for us. He was a third baseman. And then basically when we signed Machado, he was blocked. And it was like kind of clear from the moment that we saw signed Machado that Hudson Potts was going to be traded. It was just sort of like, when will that happen? Not if. And he's completely flamed out uh, in, in the minors and has, has basically stalled. Uh, Mitch Moreland obviously came and was a rental and, and was whatever for us as a de- designated hitter. Um, but all of this is to get to. Do you want to talk about those trades? You, ha- you did the work on that. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, just real quick, I'll touch on them. And it's just that Jorge Mateo ended up being worth uh, 0.8 for us and like 0.8 uh, total million dollars, uh, but then ended up being worth, we DFA'd him and then he ended up being worth $28 million for the Orioles, despite I'll say having an 81 WRC plus, which is kind of my uh, pro Cronenworth argument. Like if you can provide good defense and hit, at all you're valuable and so Cronenworth is as a second baseman very much is not as a first baseman though uh but that was a little bit of surplus value Trevor Rosenthal had nearly five million dollars worth of excess value Moreland actually cost us 2.5 million dollars worth of excess value but it ended up being like those trades that you just went over we had plus a tiny bit um all right I had to take a deep breath (laughs) because we're getting now to August 31st, 2020. And I wrote next to it, a day which will live in infamy. Uh, We're not celebrating that day. We are not celebrating that day uh, because that was the day that uh, two trades took place and we will break them down in extensive detail. Uh, That would be the Mike Clevenger trade and the Austin Nola trade. Um, I am going to try and go through this somewhat quickly because like, again, like we don't need to tell you guys if you are listening to the <laughs> show that these were bad trades for the Padres. Um, I think the methodology behind them is super interesting. 
Um, and uh, I think especially when looking at it through this present war lens, um, you know, it's really easy to forget that Mike Clevenger, um, you know, may he rest in piss, uh, <laughs> uh, at the time of the trade was seen as like a dude he was a top 15 top 20 pitcher in baseball and we were in desperate need of that at the time um and uh you know he was basically projected to not only come over and give us about half of a war in just a month um but also uh he was projected to put up you know 3.3 f4 in 2021 and 3.0 in 2022 uh baking in the future discount um doing the math like john said trust us on this um at the <laughs> time of the trade he was worth 6.2 present war which is a lot that's a lot um that's yeah. like a 60 future value tr player as we were as we were talking about uh and then on top of that we were also getting greg allen who was um if you remember san diego native uh was supposed to be like our fourth out like our true fourth outfielder like a guy who was like going to be here to like fill in depth, can play center field, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so at the time of that trade, he was worth somewhere around 1.3 present war value, not because he was going to put up 1.3 war in a year, but because he was going to put up like 0 0.6, 0 0.7 over the course of like four years. So baking in future discounts and everything like that. Um, the total amount of uh, present war that we were trading for was 7.5. Um, our package that we sent away consisted of current player Austin Hedges, current player and recent prospect uh, Cal Quantrill, Josh Naylor, and then straight up prospects uh, Owen Miller, Gabriel Arias, and Joey Cantillo. Um, and just to kind of go through it, uh, Austin Hedges was obviously a known entity at that point. He had been with the Padres for several seasons. Um, and, uh, you know, again, my chicken scratch math, trust me or don't. Uh, he was worth about mm -hmm. 2.5 present war, given the fact that he had several years of control left at the time that he was traded. Um, and it remains to be said, was still a very valuable player with all the defense he was putting up, you know, despite how painful he was to, uh, to watch at the plate. Uh, and then for all the other guys, I kind of just put what their their most recent prospect evals were because like Josh Naylor had basically only had a cup of coffee with the major league team. Same goes for Cal Quantrill. He had come and played in 2019. He Those two guys technically weren't prospects anymore, but they still had five years left of control. So uh, Naylor's most recent evaluation was as a 50 overall. That's worth 3.1 present war. Um, Cal Quantrill had fallen mightily in the prospect rankings. Uh, mind you, he was a first round pick uh, for us at one point. Uh, and at the time of his graduation, he was all the way down to a 40 future valuation uh, and was our 27th overall prospect. And I think, John, you had pulled a comparison of what a 40 future value pitcher is as your background falls behind you. Uh, oh, no! <laughs> no, leave it in. Leave it in. Let's go. If you, the people who are watching on YouTube got a, got a nice little visual gag. 40, 40 future value prospects are like Jackson Wolf right now, Henry Williams, who was like the post... Uh, Tommy John guy that we got in the third round and then Noel Vela, Jagger Haynes, like those kinds of guys. Um, so yeah, so not a huge, huge piece that he was once considered to be. Um, Joey Cantillo was really young at the time of this trade. He was a 45 uh, future value prospect at the time um, and was kind of his stock would seem to be rising. He, of course, uh, had went on to this year representing uh, Cleveland in the futures game. Um, he's still ranked as a, as a 40 future value prospect, according to the, this year's, uh, preseason reports. Um, but he is having a great year in the minor league so far. Uh, so, you know, he was worth 0 0.4 present war at the time of the trade. Gabriel Arias, uh, was a middle infield depth piece. Same goes for Owen Miller. Um, Arias was ranked as a 40 plus, which is worth 0 0.4 percent present war. And Owen Miller was ranked as just a straight 40 which is ranked 0 0.2. So if you add up all those guys, um, we were uh, trading 6.7 present war in value. So again, that's not an egregious, like technically like we're kind of coming out on top, you know, if you want to look at it by it's 7.5 versus 6.7, it's kind of a wash. 
Um, it's a lot of depth, uh, which is why this trade is so significant is like we cleaned out a lot of our, you know, uh, when we're thinking about, you know, guys like Matthew Batten coming up, you know, like to come and take, take over middle infield spots or uh, fill in at third base one day. That's because Owen Miller isn't there. That's because Gabriel Rice isn't there. Um, it's because we traded him away in, the, in those things. So it, it still is significant. But if you're just looking at the present war at the time of the trade, it was about a wash. Um, how has it turned out, though, John? Poorly. In 1997, <laughs> August 31st, Diana, Princess of Wales, died in a car crash. And I still think, I still think this might be the worst August 31st <laughs> that I've lived through. So <laughs> uh, I, I'm not going to do the evaluation for every single player, but I'll say that Quantrill has been worth, it seems, about $31.8 million in surplus value. Naylor... A lot of, like, half of this almost is uh, based on projections going forward, but he is currently $44.8 million in excess value. So it seems like we gave away $90 million in excess value for uh, or Greg Allen and Mike Clevenger. And Clevenger ended up being, because he got hurt, like, you can't really blame AJ Pillar for a player getting hurt. He ended up being worth actually negative three point three million in terms of value because he, we paid him twelve point six million dollars and he only gave us nine point three million dollars worth of value. So overall, we lost ninety three point seven million dollars according to my calculations on that Cleveland trade. So yeah, again, it just goes to show you that something seems like a good idea at the time you can't control the outcome this is just one of those terrible examples where it just went the worst way for the padres in a way that was completely uncontrollable to them and to aj preller for that matter so um with that in mind um let's move on to the other trade for that day <laughs> um so just to remind everyone uh austin nola uh austin adams and Dan Altavilla, Austin Adams, uh, and Dan Altavilla, of course, being some relief pitchers, uh, were traded away to the Seattle Mariners for Taylor Trammell, who um, at the time of the trade, his most recent evaluation was a 50 future value prospect. Um, of course, we had received Trammell the year before, as, as John had mentioned, in that three-team trade. And, uh, you know, at his height, Taylor Trammell was a 60 future value prospect. So to get, again, that's, Jackson Merrill, that's James Wood. Those guys are 60 future value prospects. Tramiel was seen in that light. Um, he had fallen to the point where he was a 50 future value prospect, um, which is still super valuable. You know, that's worth 3.1 present war. Um, Andres Munoz uh, was traded in that as well. He was a 40 plus future value pitching prospect. Of course, um, you know, relievers take a huge penalty in terms of future value. Uh, he was seen exclusively as a reliever, but he was throwing like 103 miles an hour at this time. Um, and then Ty France, uh, you know, it's worth remembering, despite what went on to happen, that at the time he was ranked as a 40 future value prospect. He was seen as kind of a quad A guy. He had started off the year and had a really hot start with the Padres. Uh, he was hitting like 309, I think, uh, to, to start that year and was just looking great. Um, but of course, he was blocked uh, by the Dark Lord, Eric Hosmer. <laughs> uh, and uh, so there was, quote unquote, not a place for Ty France uh, on the Padres. And uh, the last piece that was traded away was the least Torrance. So um, looking at future value, there, or excuse me, uh, present war that the Padres were trading away, um, it was th seen as 3.5 present war just based off of prospect evaluations. Now, for uh, between Adams and Altavilla, they were receiving about one present war. Um, and Austin Nola, this is super interesting. So Nola at the time um, was uh, very controversial because uh, there were a lot of people who, you know, you can read the Fangraphs article that's about his trade. And they're basically like, look at the, the underlying data behind his hot pocket, which is what the first half of 2020 was. It was a hot month, and he also had a good ending to 2019. Um, they were like, the underlying data is good here. You know, this looks like everything's backed up. Um, you know, his ex Woba was looking strong. His hitting profile was good. Um, and so 
this is kind of where the foible of Austin or of uh, AJ Preller really comes in because AJ Preller always dreams on dudes' upsides. This is something that Craig has been saying for a long time yeah. on the main show, and all he's thinking about is catch the catching position, our worst position from an organizational standpoint. We can fill it in with a guy who we have five years of team control on, and he's hitting. I think at the time he was hitting like 280 or 300 or something like that. And he had finished 2019 in the same way. And it's like, this guy, he has half of a season of great potential, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and like, just think if he's this guy going forward forever, like he is going to be insanely valuable. And, um, you know, Zips for uh, 2020 and 2021 and 2022, they projected Austin Nola to be worth about 1.5 war uh, over a full season. Now, mind you, that's with him operating in a catching timeshare, et cetera. So that's not like insanely super valuable, but it is like good to solid. You know what I mean? Like if it's like it, if if you have a catcher who's in a timeshare who's putting up like 1.5 war, like, you know, you're generating like assumingly two war from that position. That's not like going to sink your team. You know what I mean? Like, no. I, um, I would kill for that having actual the actual Austin Nola. <laughs> I would kill for the projected Austin Nola right now. So at the time of the trade, if you want to use the math that we're going off of, um, the the Padres were receiving four point eight present WAR while trading away three point five. So if you want to use that math, okay, it's fine. Like you can say that, um, but. It's worth noting that Austin Nola, of course, uh, not only had a small sample size, but is also a much older player. Um, he was 29 or 30 at the time he was traded. And uh, he was a converted infielder and had a very little track <laughs> record as a catcher. And he was not on a lot of prospect evaluators' radars like yeah. when he came up. And so it's like, those flash in the pan guys are flash in the pans kind of for a reason. And they're treated with a certain amount of skepticism for a reason. So, you know, according to our numbers, you know, it was a totally defensible trade from the Padres, but there were plenty of people at the time who were, you know, saying like, I don't know, this seems steep. Like, I don't know, this is a lot. And, um, John, I'm going to toss it to you to talk about how this has kind of worked out. Um, but you know, uh, people were saying, I don't know, this is a lot because Taylor Trammell is a great prospect and, uh, you know, sort of rumblings about yeah. Andres Munoz and no one was really talking about Ty France in the way that obviously they would. So what went on to happen? The, yeah, the, the part, I guess that in retrospect, which I wasn't saying at the time, cause I didn't know who Austin Ola was at the time just in your evaluation, you're going off batted ball data. That's all fair, but you're going off batted ball data. That's exclusively in the summer during happy fun ball time. And that that's like, it was the worst sample size in which to trade for a player. I feel like, yeah. because it's just like, if, if, if you have warning track power in 2020, you have second deck power. And that's kind of what happened, it seems like, is that his whole season was during the summer, and it was happy fun ball time, so he, was, he could smoke a baseball. And then, I mean, how would you guess that, I mean, you, you could guess that the season wouldn't be all summer, because it won't be going forward, but you couldn't guess that they would change the ball, and it does seem like he has warning track power at best. So part of it is, is definitely bad luck, but part of it is that A.J. Preller seems to be somebody who is great at gathering lottery tickets. He's better than most people at gathering lottery tickets. Based on this information that we've just looked up, as well as our draft review, which I think he's above average at drafting, not as good as maybe some people tout him to be, but above average, and then... He's great at gathering lottery tickets. He can see a good athletic body, and if you get 100 of them, three of them are going to turn out. But if your job is to get one catcher for a stretch run and you have a lottery ticket-type mentality behind how you're looking to gain a player, then I could see how it would not fit or not work a lot of the time. You know what I mean? So like, it might have been that if you had 100 Austin Nolas, like 10 of them end up being superstars for very cheap. But 
that's not what you need when you're a competitive team in my in my perspective. And so just looking at this trade from like how I did my math, Ty France ended up being worth, I mean, he's already worth $50.4 million in terms of how well he's performed so far, but in terms of future value, subtracting how much you've had to pay for him, $61.6 million, very valuable player, obviously. Andres Munoz requires a lot more uh, valuing how he's going to continue going going forward as well as he got like an amazing contract from the Mariners so it's really hard to like say what he would have got with us but my calculation ends up being that he's worth about as much as Ty France a little bit more 70 million dollars in terms of excess value Terence's is negative value Tremel slightly positive they kind of cancel each other out and then Nola Altavia and Adams were all worth about $2 million total in, in the, if you do my math overall, based on how I said that I do my math, it's that we lost $130 million on that trade. And that is not including the Matt Brash trade, which I don't know if you want to get into that at all, but I have the math on that as well. Um, just go for it. Yeah. So, so, so far he's provided $14.5 million excess value and projecting going forward another 30, which makes $45 million which means those two trades, which I feel like a lot of people get confused on, like kind of mix match them up because they happened at the same time and were technically separate deals, but with the same team. In total, that deal ended up being worth about negative $175 million. For sure. Um, <laughs> um, and, cool, and, cool. and for the year, for the year, if you include the Clevenger trade, it ends up being that we lost $266 million which is one Fernando Tatis trade. So this is the opposite of the tra Fernando Tatis trade. We basically lost a Fernando Tatis trade this COVID year. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, again, it's that axiom of being at the casino. If you, uh, you leave with even <laughs> money, you won. You should have quit. Yeah. He should have quit during the Luis Castillo yeah, exactly. trade. And he would have been the greatest GM of all time. Exactly. If he had just <laughs> left on July 30th of 2016, mm -hmm. it would have been perfect. Um, so 2021, uh, I, I didn't, th there's not really anything interesting from like a future value standpoint. I'm going to save that for the Soto trade. So if you want to speed through anything up until the Soto trade, please be my guest. Yeah. Uh, 2021, we are 61 and 47 at the time at the trade deadline. So buyers, we trade Marcano and Sawinski for Frazier was kind of the major trade. Um, we, we we lost on the Marisnik and Thompson trades overall, but I, I, I'll i just give you the math overall. The real big loss was that Sawinski has provided kind of $64 million in excess value. A lot of that is projections going forward, but even if you don't include those, if he doesn't do anything going forward, he's already made the Pirates $31 million in excess value. Overall, if you include projections, we lost about $60 million that year. Well, that's not ideal um so and we went over the tax for it we went over the tax for oh, right. to lose 61 <laughs> um so let's move on to 2022 um you know there were some really interesting trades this year um you know talking about the paddock pagan to uh trading for rogers and brent rooker uh you know that's an interesting trade obviously there was the hater trade as well um, but really like there's only one trade that I have prepared to talk about, uh, that's super fascinating from a future value standpoint. Um, and you know, we could talk about kind of the merits of it if you want. And that's the Soto trade. Uh, did you want to touch on any of those other ones before we got into the Soto trade and finish off with that? No, that's, that's for a next year or two years from now version yeah. of par, I think, cause it's, they're just hard to analyze when they're so close. The stats don't really do much. Yeah. Um, I would just say like, you know, wa watch out for Robert Gasser. Um, he's going to be an interesting prospect. He was, he was kind of someone I was uh, a little bummed to lose. Um, but of course was very stoked to get Josh Hader. So I didn't fucking care. Um, but you know, he, especially in Milwaukee who have a kind of a panache for developing pitchers, I'll be intrigued if they can uh, turn him into someone that's interesting. Um, so let's talk about the Soto trade. Um, this is where I think the, uh, culmination of everything we've talked about in terms of assigning present war to future prospects. This is like going to be, you know, I don't know what the equivalent, if there's like a, a GM university or something like that, like where this would be taught in classrooms. 
but this trade is going to be taught in classrooms as kind of a uh, the realization of this idea because um, we're going to just kind of break down who was traded for what, but uh, this is so, this is super cool when I did this map. I was like, oh my God, this is like so awesome. This has worked out. So um, as a refresher for everyone, not that you need to be reminded, uh, Juan Soto and Josh Bell uh, were traded to the Padres for uh, James Wood, Robert Hassel III, CJ Abrams, and Mackenzie Gore. So uh, Juan Soto's uh, Zips projections he was uh, traded in the middle of uh, the year. He had two months left on the year. Uh, he was projected for about six war that year. So just prorating that, he would have projected to put up about two war in the remaining two months of the season. Um, on top of that, in 2023 and 2024, at the time, he was also projected to put up six point war, 6.6 .6 war in each of those seasons. However, um, as we've mentioned, present war is more valuable than future war. And so the way that Fangraphs decays future war um, is basically uh, by saying, you know, uh, the the next year you 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 tax someone eight percent. You basically take their their future war for the next year and say, okay, ninety two percent of that is what the is what uh, it's worth in the present value. And then if you wanted to do two years from now, you'd say, okay, what's ninety two percent squared? And then you tax it, you tax them that much. And then it goes on and on and on and on in that way to the point where, you know, if you're predicting five, six years down the road, your, your future war is like super heavily taxed because there's so much uncertainty and everything that's baked in there. Um, so anyway, baking in the, the future value tax for Juan Soto, we can say that at the time of his trade, he was worth 13.7 present war. Um, Josh Bell um at the time he had put up 2.5 f4 so far uh in uh, washington that season so you could say he's probably worth about one win uh coming over so that means that we were trading for 14.7 present war now at the time of the trade the marquee player going over from a prospect evaluation standpoint was cj abrams cj abrams was ranked as a 60 future value prospect um that is worth 6.1 present war. Uh, Robert Hassel was ranked as a 50 position pr player prospect. That is worth 3.1 war. James Wood, at the time, his stock quickly rose, but at the time he was also considered a 50 future value prospect. Um, that put him also at 3.1 present war. And finally, Mackenzie Gore, who had pitched half of a season with the Padres, but you know, for all intents and purposes, I still want to treat him like a prospect. Um, he was ranked most recently as a 50 future value pitching prospect, and that is worth 2.3 present war. So in total, we traded away in prospect capital, 14.6 present war. Now, if you remember what I just said in terms of what we were receiving from Soto and Bell, we were receiving 14.7 present war. So this is what I was talking about a few minutes ago. This is so fucking cool to me as a nerd to say, <laughs> okay, this is kind of how you can see how these two sides sort of justify yeah. the trade from each of their sides. And they say, okay, this is how much Juan Soto is worth to us right now. And Josh Bell is worth to us right now. They put that together. What would that cost in prospect capital? And it's literally what was traded. It's literally what was traded. And so, and again, like, who knows what's going to happen with Juan Soto this year? He's currently trending a little bit under his, uh, you know, preseason zips ranks, but not by much. He's still going to eclipse five war, at least super valuable. Um, Josh Bell obviously didn't work out the way that it did. And it's worth mentioning, like CJ Abrams, uh, you know, we'll see. Um, he, he's, he's, we'll see Robert Hassel. We'll see. Um, James Wood, he quickly climbed to a 60 future value prospect and is now a top five prospect universally consensus in baseball. And he could end up being the player that really hurts from this deal. Um, but I just found this whole thing. I, I'm so glad we're ending on the Soto trade from that perspective, because it's like, it is the culmination <laughs> the realization of every all the ideas we were talking about in this in trying to you know reconcile 
present value of prospects for future value and major league players. So that's all I have to say on that, John. It makes me a little bit suspicious as to whether that's literally what goes into it. You know, like, do they have similar evaluations and are like, I mean, because you all have your proprietary information. I feel like you'd want to present information that is available to more people so that they could look it up. And then if it were me, I would want to have my own evaluations, which are, which are separate from the like my pr- proprietary evaluations are separate from like the widely known evaluations, because this does look like an almost exactly even trade from something that you or I would look up, which seems like a fair like ask from yeah. you. And you might have different evaluations, but like it seems like a fair ask, right? I do wonder if that if that comes into play. I bet it does on account of I've seen GMs refer to baseball trade values as something they look at, which is like that shows me which GMs do not have proprietary information that's very good. The fact that they're like double checking on baseball trade values, like <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I think, anyways, like that's uh, yeah. But anyways, so yeah, so I have Juan Soto has been worth. $13.6 million in terms of excess value and then worth $50 million going forward, which is obviously a lot of money. However, James Wood has really shot through like the prospect evaluation going forward. And it makes it so that him plus Abrams plus Gore Hassel's actually fallen a lot, but still overall, they're up a little bit. It has it overall that they are actually plus $122 million, But once again, this is like, this is the trade that I would say the most is just very recent and based on prospect evaluations more than any other trade at all. So this is like a hugely wide standard deviation, probably as high as the number itself, which is 122 million. But it does seem like we probably have lost that trade overall, which is something you expect when you're trying to trade for somebody who is providing you value for a season going into the playoffs and then uh, during your open window. Although $122 million is a high tax with which to pay for it. Yeah. Partially that's because James Wood has jumped a lot and Juan Soto has played probably at like 40th percentile of his outcomes. Not terribly, but like maybe not more than you would expect, especially last season at the end of the year. But in like a conclusion of this, it seems like there's a huge discrepancy in terms of AJ Preller's ability to generate value for his team overall when he's selling versus when he's buying. I think that we can both agree that the the negatives are hugely negative and the positives are hugely positive, which is probably the case when you're a GM that makes splashy moves, you know? If you make a ton of moves while you're selling and selling on average makes more value per sell, which it does, then those moves are likely to generate more value overall. However, if you're making huge splashy moves when you're buying, when buying tends to come with a tax, then you're you're much more likely to lose a lot of money, which he has like every single year that he's been buying, he's lost a lot of money. And in fairness to AJ Preller, overall, he has actually, according to my calculations, been almost $200 million in uh like excess like he's had pr- like product productivity of 200 million dollars in terms of his trades that being said most of them were based on selling for like 5 years in a row where he made like 285 million 45 million 41 million 382 million and then all of his buying years have been negative right which yeah. is something that you would expect but i i do wonder whether a person who is great at generating lottery tickets, which is my current hypothesis on what AJ Preller is, is great at rounding out the edges of a roster and like creating the artwork that needs to take place in order to win a championship. Because he seems like a great builder, which is a great value to have. Like you can make a career as a GM based on being like a great builder. And it seems like he is a great builder. He's an above average drafter. And when he's trying to build trades, he creates a lot of excess value. Like, I would want him if I were the Pirates right now. I would want him if I were any team that's struggling, the Detroit Tigers. But I don't know if I want him as a GM when I'm trying to win a championship. Yeah. So, I think it's a really good sentiment to leave this episode on. Um, 
I think this is like a super interesting um, dive that we've that we've done. I, I you know this episode kind of came together in like a weird way. Like we were just I was coming back from honeymoon and everything, and we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do. And um, you know I'm looking forward to doing this for the off season uh, when we when we do it in the off season because I think it'll be interesting to compare how AJ Preller trades in the middle of the season versus in the off season. And because again, like in the the off season, you know, you can look at the macro sort of side of things, but, but the, but the buyer and seller labels are not quite as tangible at that time, you know, Um, you know, theoretically everyone's trying to win. I mean, obviously that's not the case. There are teams that are in different phases of their rebuilds, Um, but it'll be interesting to compare those two and look forward to that. Um, once again, we hope you're watching us on YouTube, um, Padres Hot Tub on YouTube. Subscribe to us there. Like, comment, tell your friends, bring a friend next time. Um, come join us on Patreon for the absolute shit show that it's going to be the trade deadline. Uh, you know, whether or not the Padres. <laughs> it'll uh, be fun. It'll be, it'll be something. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, fun, you know, hemorrhoids are fun for some people, but I don't know if they're <laughs> fun for me. What? For who? Um, <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, uh, we're going to be following it all no matter what. So uh, we hope you'll join us for there and uh, we'll come back to you soon with another episode next week. So uh, John, anything you want to add before we dip out of here? Go Padres. We'll see if we're buyers or sellers. I mean, according to the math, hopefully we're sellers. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. But I mean, hey, if we just swept the Tigers when you're listening to this, then who knows? Um, and if we didn't, sorry for jinxing that. Jinxing. Yeah. yeah. Curses aren't real. Curses aren't real. Signing off for Padres Hot Tub. John Bacota. <laughs> I'm Ravy Cantor. Fuck your curse. Goodbye. <laughs>